and it hits me, oh my gosh, this is that triangle. You know, there's explanation for everything that occurred in the Rendlesham Forest incident that doesn't involve aliens at all. It was completely silent. It comes right over our heads. He saw a classic flying saucer really standing in the clearing. He turned over to my father and held his hand and he looked in his eyes and he said, we're not alone. Welcome to Podcast UFO for our live show. During the show, feel free to participate live in our chat room. And don't forget to like us on our very active Facebook page. Hello and welcome to the show. We have uh, Luis Elizondo with us today. Um, probably don't need to say too much about him. I'm sure if you've been watching this topic, you know exactly who he is. He ran uh, ATIP, and uh, we're going to be talking about that and so much more. Welcome to the show, Lou. Sure, thank you for having me. Okay, so let's uh, tackle this um, hard question right off the bat. Last year at MUFON, I remember you saying to um, everyone in the audience to be skeptical. And so what do you think about the people who are skeptical about you and that you had any involvement in ATIP? Um, in particular, um, let's see, there was an article that recently uh, came out, uh, Keith Clore's article, and uh, it's saying that uh, I believe uh, the Secretary of Defense for Intelligence, the name was Sherwood, uh, said that uh, he didn't think that uh, you were involved uh, with the ATIP program any time at all. Sure. Well, first and foremost, look, uh, in today's day of, of media, it, it look, everyone's entitled to their own opinion. And, and not everyone is necessarily going to agree with or even like what, what, what we're doing. And especially, I think, when we're talking about speaking about topics as, as rich and, and potentially as, as obscure and, and contentious at times as UFOs. And because of that, people are always going to have to, to try to poke holes in a story. Um, I get it. That's, that's just what the media does. But I, I'm, I'm very confident, uh, along with others uh, that are in senior positions of the U.S. government, uh, of my of my credentials, um, the U, the Department of Defense is a, is a large bureaucracy, and sometimes it takes time for information to trickle down. Um, so this may very well be one of those cases. Um, and you know, frankly, I'm I'm pretty optimistic that at some point here their their position may change again. So it's not an unfortunate. I wish I wish I'd say it's unusual, but but uh, yeah. sometimes it takes a while for information to. Keeping in mind, for the last year and a half, they, they had already said for the record um, that I, I actually was part of the program. So, you know, I, <laughs> yeah. I think they probably got their wires crossed somewhere. When you read articles like this, does it discourage you and make you want to just, you know, turn away from this whole thing? No, 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 no. I mean, like I said, people are entitled to their opinions, and it's, and it's going to continue to happen. Um, I, I think that, look, we live in a society where everybody has a right to an opinion. It doesn't matter how goofy or 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 serious it is and i think that's what makes our society so so great so you know people are going to have have opinions as, as they've had opinions for the last 70 years on this topic quite frankly so do i think that that opinions are going to change just because i happen to be the the, the person du jour on this topic no absolutely not I, I think it's you know this is um i hate to say it, but it's, a, it's as american as apple pie and you know that's what happens when you live in a free society we we allow everybody to have a voice I watched the screener for Unidentified, and I was thrilled by how well it was produced, and I thought uh, the content was great and what it revealed and everything. And um, I think the Nimitz may prove to be one of the most uh, important encounters. Uh, a lot of it had to do, the notoriety had to do with the videos. And, uh, you know, a couple of videos came out. We have a very visual society anyway. And are, are there going to be more videos coming out that we can... Um, eventually get to see well certainly but let me define you know coming out on this particular series or the next episode you know uh i you know i think i think more videos will be coming out yes but not necessarily uh through our show immediately because at the end of the day videos are just one aspect of many 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 when you're trying to to if you will build a case on something you know eyewitness testimony is very important Video is very important. Radar data is very important. Electro-optical data, gun camera footage is very important. Uh, and it's it's a much bigger story than just a video or two or three videos. Um, I think the viewer will appreciate as you begin to watch more and more of these. 
uh, you will you will begin to realize that this is a much much bigger, much more comprehensive enigma that we are facing. And although videos are neat because people look at it and say, "Oh, wow, that look at that thing," um, this is this is much more compelling. And when you begin to actually listen to the eyewitnesses, these are men and women who are still active duty in uniform, and and you see what the 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 struggle that and 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 potentially in some cases even even putting them in harm's way, uh, and then have this discussion in front of the American people, I, I think people will begin to realize this is a very um, this is a very interesting question that we need that we need to answers to. And, there's, and yeah, there's a national security aspect to this, and it's not just hey, I saw something flying when I was flying my F-18. Um, and I think as we continue with a few more of these episodes, it's going to become very very apparent that that this is truly a global phenomenon. Was there a certain event that made you decide to quit the Department of Defense, or was this something that just uh, came about gradually? Well, first of all, if, if I may be frank with you, I, I, personally speaking, I've seen and, and know too much at this point to, to simply ignore the fact and turn my back and, and, and not address that, that these crafts are real, that they exist. Um, it's frankly just overwhelming evidence, and my background being a, a, a no kidding investigator uh, throughout my career and intelligence officer, we have a, a responsibility to report, um, and it's also a, a duty to warn. And so, when you go to the airport, right, or you go to a train station, you hear that that that, that, that famous announcement: you know, see something, say something, report it when in doubt, see something suspicious. Um, when it comes to these things. It's the opposite approach. Until recently, it was don't report these things because you might lose your clearance. You might, you might wind up being taken off flight status. They may put you some sort of psychological evaluation, uh, and it's detrimental to your career. And so I found that very dangerous because the only thing more dangerous than something flying in our skies and we don't know what it is and there's nothing we can do about it is not even being able to have a conversation. That is, to me, unacceptable. And so my decision to leave the department was in part because of my loyalty to the department, not disloyalty. I understand that at the time, Secretary Mattis, this is a man that I, I served in a combat theater with, and I have the utmost and greatest respect for this man. I've seen him literally make decisions that, that save people's lives right there on the spot. So so this is a man, through my experience, who, who should have more information, not less. And when he's in a position of, of Secretary of Defense, not even being able to let him know, look, these things are in our, our controlled airspace and they're coming close to our to our pilots and to the point where you almost have a mid-air collision. Um, that's a problem. And simply because of stigma and taboo, frankly, I don't give it a hoot what the stigma and taboo is. You've got to tell the boss. And when the bureaucracy doesn't allow that to happen, then I think there's a failure of the system. And we have to we have to fix that failure. And so, in fact... Going back to your question, leaving what made me leave the department, it wasn't necessarily a single event. It was a, a constant frustration of reporting and briefing senior DOD leadership on these things and this resistance to say, look, hey, we know, Lou, these things are real. You're right. This is compelling. We've got the pilot's testimony. We got it. But we're not quite sure we want to tell the boss yet. That to me – and by the way, I'm not blaming them because, you know, how do you tell a guy, by the way, who's named Mad Dog Mattis – that there's something in our sky and we don't know what it is and we don't know how to stop it, keeping in mind that Department of Defense is an organization that, that is designed to have answers. And you do not want to go to the boss without any type of recommended course of action. Um, so I get it. But at the same time, I don't think this is like a conversation about fine wine and the longer we keep a cork on it, the better it gets. I, I think we need to have the conversation now. In fact, I think we need to have the conversation five years ago, if you ask me. Um, and so I left the department. Sometimes if you love an organization enough, if you want to fix it, you have to leave it. And, and by the way, you know, need I remind you that Secretary Mattis, almost a year to the day, day that I resigned, he did the same thing. He resigned out of principle. So um, sometimes you have to leave an organization and fix it from the outside if you really, if you really love it and you want, to, you, want to, you want to help. One of the things I hear quite a bit that people are speculating – and I'm going to ask you, are you currently any type of contractor for the government in any type of capacity at this time? No, I don't I have no idea where that came from. Uh, <laughs> if, if I am, I'm sure not getting paid. <laughs> That's pretty funny. Um, you know, I watched the 
the live stream when TTSA launched back in October, I guess it was October 11th, 2017, and was surprised that there was so little press about it. Then December 16th, the same year, everything changed when the New York Times article co-authored by Helen Cooper, Ralph Blumenthal, and Leslie Kane was published. What was that like for you when that happened? Oh, gosh. Um, and I'll be honest with you, I'm a creature of the shadows. I, I've spent my entire life living in the shadows. Uh, out of, out of being, frankly, that's a matter of our, our job. So it is not my nature to be in the middle of the spotlight. Um, personally, it's, it's rather uh, uncomfortable for me. But at the same time, um, I think the message is very important. And so um, I'm doing what, what I feel is necessary. Now, if you want a very poor analogy, I've often told people, you know, I, I, I think of myself as this albino cave newt living somewhere in the recess of some back cave, dark and happy, and you know, uh, and all of a sudden, someone taking this little this little lizard that's been happy its whole life, living in the dark, and ripping it out and putting it in the middle of the hot desert sun on noon, on a noon uh, around twelve o'clock in the afternoon, and people start poking at it. Um, it's it's not my 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 natural environment, uh, but at the same time. Um, I think I think the message is important enough that we have the collective conversation with the American people. Well, right after that came out, I interviewed longtime UFO researcher Stanton Friedman, who we sadly recently lost. And uh, he said that his biggest question is, why now is the government letting this out? Can you address that? Well, I can't answer on behalf of the government because I'm no longer employed by the government, but my question would be, would be in return, well, how come not five years ago? How come not 10 years ago? And, and I, I can't answer that. I don't know why. Um, it may very well be that we now are at the point where enough people um, are seeing these things, and maybe maybe it's a cultural thing. I really don't know. Maybe, it's, maybe, maybe we're at a point where, where, as a culture, we are more willing to accept the fact that there are things still in nature that we don't understand. I mean, let's look at it this way. You know, up until recently, there was a statement by some folks saying, hey, you know, we've discovered every species that there is to discover. And, of course, every year we find new and more species. Um, up until recently, we had defined a living organism as something that kind of looks like, you know, an animal, if you will, and breeds and, and reproduces. And yet we find that life is diverse. It's plentiful. It's, it, you can go to the, the deepest, darkest part of the Marianas Trench, seven miles down, and find life. You can go a mile under the Antarctic ice, and you can find life. You can go to a, to, to a location on Earth where these extremophiles exist, and we look at this and say, how can a creature live in total darkness and in you know, many, many, many degrees uh, Fahrenheit above what we can tolerate and, and, and live happy, and, in fact, thrive? So... The definition of life is something that we continue to, to look at and ask ourselves a question. Medically speaking, um, you, know, you could look at a virus and say, wow, is that a living thing? Well, in some cases it does things like the living thing. It reproduces and, and it, it, will, it will do other things uh, to survive. Um, but in other cases, you know, it doesn't have DNA. So what, what makes something alive? I, I suspect if you were to come to Earth and, and look at a plant and look at a human being, you probably would say, wow, those are completely different life forms, um, and yet they are living. They, we have a lot of things in common with plants. We reproduce, we compete for resources, we grow, we die. Um, so I don't know. That's, that's a really good question. I, I don't know why now. Um, you know, I don't know. What do you think about the Navy's new reporting of unidentified aircraft? Do you think this forward motion has in part uh, happened because of TTSA and your efforts? Well, it is undeniably as a result of what TTSA engaged in, but it's not just Luis Elizondo. I, I don't, I don't want people to have the misconception that hey, Luis here driving the train and making this happen because because it's not. It's a team effort. We have folks like Chris Mellon. This is a man who who knows more about government inner workings and bureaucracy than just about anybody else on the planet. You have folks like like Jim Simivan, senior CIA. A representative who knows about the intelligence community probably better than anybody. You have Dr. Hal Pudoff, who's a scientist, world-renowned scientist, and and Steve Justice and Tom DeLong. This is a team effort, and it's not just you know talking to one person and now the Navy changes their mind and starts allowing their pilots to report this stuff. Uh, this is a, a a coordinated 
it's a bit like a symphony, symphony, if you will. It's a coordinated effort. Every instrument has their own sheet of music to play, has its own purpose, and has to be in melody, if you will, with the rest of the instruments. So we are constantly coordinating with each other and, and, and engaging the certain points within the U.S. government that we think need to be engaged in order for them to be educated on what's really going on. And then with that information, you allow them to make the decision, okay, yeah, you know what? There's something there. Maybe we should, we should change our policy. Um, and by the way, it's not just with us as a company. It's also working with our government partners. We don't want to alienate them. They're not necessarily the enemy here. We have to work with them. And so the best way to do that is to work in a collaborative, collaborative way where, where we coordinate with them. They can coordinate with us. We can freely exchange information back and forth. And that's how you, you, you make change. So this question in particular comes from a longtime UFO researcher. And he wanted to know, did you use the resources of anyone at NASIC, that's National Air and Space Intelligence Center, at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base? Um, I, I can't specifically talk about who we have or are partnering with right now. Okay. Keeping in mind some of these relationships are still, or in some cases they're nascent, and in other cases they're still a little bit sensitive. Um, so we have to be mindful a lot of times when we mention specifically who we're working with, um, because it's still a, it's a sensitive topic, and, and some folks still you know get a little bit uncomfortable, if you will. I met you down at uh, Cherry Hill at the MUFON event, and during the conference there, I believe you said that you think that we're actually going through disclosure. Um, where do you think things are going in the future? Uh, what's your take on that? Well, let me put it this way. Um, a year and a half ago, if we were to have this conversation, we would probably be laughed uh, out of the building that we were we were in if this was a government building. And if you were to talk to a TV TV production studio, they would probably very quickly dismiss you. <laughs> and uh, they'd be polite, but they'd say, you know, we're not really interested in this. Um, look how far we've come in just the last year and a half. You have now the government admitting that it did indeed have a UFO program, that it, it was indeed funded, that actual academic studies were, were conducted, that videos were actually collected and obtained and analyzed. You now have the, the admission by several elements in the government that these things are indeed real. And now you have changing of policy at a national level that allows the reporting and the collection of data of these things. And by the way, there's a lot more things that have occurred that I probably can't talk about right now, but it'll come to light. So I think we've come light years uh, ahead of where we were just a year and a half ago. And if you look at even the show that we're doing now with our, uh, with the History Channel, a &E's History Channel, this isn't a UFO hunting show. This isn't a, a an entertainment show. This isn't even a reality show. This is a show about reality. What they've done is if they've assigned, maybe a year and a half ago, they would have assigned some entertainment producers to do a show like this. This is not what they did. History Channel decided to assign some of the most hardened investigative journalists that have spent their careers looking at the underbelly of, of, of the human race in things like, like sex trafficking and, and, and corruption and organized crime. Even the camera crew that they assigned to this thing, a lot of these folks have been in, in, in combat theaters filming U.S. troops under fire. So this is an investigative journalistic piece. In fact, they won't even let me see this, the, the, the episodes before the public because they want to keep that investigative journalistic integrity, and I admire them for that. Wow. So what you are seeing is raw footage. It, we, you know, there are no retakes. There are no scripts. Look, I'm not a Hollywood guy. I'm, I'm, you know, I'm, an, I'm an old intel guy and a you know, dumb shoe investigator. So you could, even if you wanted me to act, I'm not going to be a very good actor. So we realized very early on that in order for this to work, it had to be real. And what the audience see, what you see is what you get. Um, and it's, it's, that's it, and we'll let the audience decide for themselves. I know you said something along the lines where you don't know what's happening in uh, each episode as before it comes out, but can you give us an idea what we might be expecting down the line on ad unidentified? Yeah, I mean, because I was I was there obviously for the filming. I, yeah. I can I have an I have a general understanding, but I don't really know what the what they decide to put in and what leaves the. There was a tremendous amount of information we obtained, and. I think what you'll realize and the audience will realize, hopefully, is that this is truly a global phenomenon. This is something that does have a national security nexus. 
and it is a conversation that we should have as the American people. And by the way, I think they'll also have a great appreciation that there's some people working behind the scenes very, very hard, and they're doing some incredible work. And I think our, our service men and women in uniform uh, deserve the most credit. Uh, these folks are, are the best of the best this country has, and they're brave, and they're patriots, and, and they're doing their duty. And they're doing it for the first time, stepping out of the shadows, where a year and a half ago, frankly, they could have lost their jobs to it. And now you have the Navy and the PAO actually allowing folks to step forward and have a conversation on, on, on the public stage. I mean, that's, that's remarkable. I mean, just a year and a half ago, imagine how far we've come in just a year and a half on this topic. You now have major media outlets really taking this seriously once and for all. I mean, of course, you know, going back to your original question to me, you've got, got some folks out there that are, you know, still trying to push a narrative. But look how far we've come. And I think that's, that's very encouraging. And I think, I think the American people are ready to have the conversation. Why not? I thought one of the best parts of episode one was the female pilot that remained anonymous. Um, she did look rather shaken. Do you think someone like her will feel more comfortable in the future as more of this type of thing is validated? I hope so. I hope so. I can't answer on her behalf. Um, I, I certainly hope so. I know for me, I still sometimes find myself looking over my shoulder. And, and But let me put this into context. Just very recently, I had a conversation with a, with a colleague of mine at the Pentagon. He said, you know, Lou, a conversation you and I had to have in the shadows behind a, a vault, behind a, you know, a skiff, and we'd have to whisper, I can now have this conversation openly in, some, in, in the halls of the Pentagon. And that, that represents wow. a seismic shift and where this conversation is going. You have people actively wanting to help, whereas before they would run away in the opposite direction and say, man, don't ever mention that to me again. Now they're saying, hey, look, how can I help? But what can we do as an organization, as an agency, as an institution to help? And I, I mean, that's, that's tremendous. Are you kidding me? I mean, in a year and a half, that conversation has come that far? Yeah, right, that's true. Uh, were you initially hesitant when you uh, were getting involved with what, Tom DeLong was putting together? Nope. Never even knew who he was. Uh, I, 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 um, I did not. Um, look, let me tell you, everybody on this team has a, has a very special... Um, everybody, if we were a bit of a... Our little company is a bit like a Swiss Army knife. Uh, everybody can do a, a particular function very, very well. In Tom's case, this is a man... Everybody knows him as, I guess, a, a lead singer to a couple bands, but what they don't know is that he's brilliant. He, he is truly... Uh, it, extremely creative and and quite frankly he's he managed to get to the highest levels of the government uh on this topic when nobody wanted to have a conversation he's tenacious um i think as i've said before you know sometimes in a crowded room you need, need a megaphone tom is definitely that megaphone he's not afraid to to about his reputation he does what he feels is right and i gotta give him credit for that look I, sometimes i've told people before you want to you want to sometimes you need a bull in a china shop uh, in Tom's case, some, <laughs> it's more like a fragmentation grenade. <laughs> but you know, sometimes you need to you need to break a little china in order to to fix a system. And he's been very very effective at doing that. And frankly, he's he's just a really decent human being. I mean, I, I've I've had a chance in my career to work with a lot of people, and some good and some not so good. Tom is right up there at the top of the list. He is just a decent human being. He wants to do the right thing. He's willing to do whatever he has to do, including putting his own money and his own reputation on the line. He left He left one of the world's largest punk rock bands to, to pursue this because he felt that this was the right thing to do. I don't know how many people out there are willing to do that. A lot of people are willing to get off of their opinions about this, but when push comes to shove, you think they'd leave their job to do it? Heck no. You think they'd, they'd leave their careers behind to pursue this? Heck no. You know, so I think uh, I think I think we need to give him credit where credit is due. He has definitely moved the needle on this conversation. That's right, and you know I think there's a lot of jealousy because you know Tom came out of nowhere, basically, and people have been on this topic, some of them for a good part of their lives, and uh, so there's some jealousy out there. But you know we really do have to give him credit because you know you and I wouldn't be even talking today. And um, he really has changed a lot. Look, we, we got to get over this jealousy thing. There's yeah. nothing to be jealous about. We're 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 we're, we're trying to have the, the conversation that we've been that that some folks have been trying to have for a very long time. This should be cause for celebration. This is not time to be petty and and you know it's 
this is a time for all of us to work together and say, hey, you know, this is an important topic. This is something that involves humanity. Um, that's my opinion anyways. I, I don't think there's any reason for anybody to be jealous. This is, look, this is a team effort. This is a group effort. You know, had it, had it not been for folks having an interest in this for the last, I guess, you know, 70 years, maybe we, we wouldn't have gotten to where we are today. You know, everybody, everybody should accept credit for this. This is not a TTSA thing or even a history channel thing. This is, you know, this is, this is a, this is something that everybody should look at and say, Hey, I, you know, I had a little part of that. Hmm. You're doing this show right now. You are doing this podcast. Mm -hmm. You have a part of this. You are very much integral to the conversation. I mean, don't look now, but that's exactly what you're doing. You are very as much part as we are, you are too. And so are your listeners because they're taking the time to listen to this rather than, you know, change the the, the channel to something else. You know, they could be uh, I won't <laughs> I won't say specifically what, but you know, there's lots of things that people can listen to and watch these days and by them tuning in to 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 your program, that should be an indicator that 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 you are part of this 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 sea change, and so are your listeners. Everybody, every one of us have have a part. Lou, thanks so much. It's been an absolute pleasure. Yes, sir. Thank you very much. The pleasure's been mine. Thank you. All right, everyone. That was Lou Alizondo, and check out the series "Unidentified Inside America's UFO Investigation," and that's on Fridays at. 10 p.m. on History Channel. And this is Martin Willis with Podcast UFO. And keep your eyes to the sky.